I'm at a pre-election party in Warsaw, ahead of what a lot of people are describing as one of the most important Polish elections in a generation. There's a Polish joke that God put Poland between Germany and Russia so that it's always fighting one or the other. So it's fitting that this election is taking place over the backdrop of the war in Ukraine and comes after years of the ruling Christian Nationalist Law and Justice Party being at odds with the German-led European Union over its anti-democratic judicial reforms, the rights of asylum seekers, as well as rolling back LGBTQ and women's rights. He broke the constitution, our law, and he tried to broke our election. So as Poland has inched closer to Viktor Orban's Hungary in recent years, a lot of people are asking, is Polish democracy broken? Let's start by going back a couple of decades. Poland was never a part of the Soviet Union, but it was a satellite state. And when the communist bloc collapsed in 1989, so did the country's economy. Remember last year when everyone was complaining about inflation when it was between 7 and 10%? Well, in 1989, Poland had an inflation of 250%, which rose to 585% in 1990, then back down to 70% the following year, which seems reasonable in comparison, but it's almost 10 times what we were complaining about last year. In fact, it took an entire decade for inflation to come back down to under 10% in 1989. So as you might expect, governments were a little unstable during that time. They went through eight administrations in eight years. The longest lasted for about a year and nine months, the shortest only 37 days. That's 13 days shorter than Liz Truss's time in office. In the late 90s though, Jerzy Buzek of the center-right Solidarity Electoral Action Party, or AWS, became the first prime minister to serve a full four years in office. And while AWS disappeared after his term, from the ashes of that party rose the two main players in today's politics. The civic platform was founded by Donald Tusk and other center-right politicians, none of whom came from AWS, but a ton of AWS members switched over to them when Buzek's party started to dissolve. Meanwhile, Buzek's justice minister, Lech Kaczynski, was so popular among more conservative voters who wanted Poland to have a real Christian conservative party, that he and his twin brother Yaroslav founded their own party, Law and Justice, or Peace. No, let's not be children, it's not PIS, it's Peace. But it took a couple more years before those two parties became the dominant forces they are today, because this is what the same, the Polish parliament, had looked like since 1989. About half of it was consistently controlled by the left. But in 2004, one corruption scandal too many caused the left to completely collapse and almost entirely disappear from Polish politics. And they haven't recovered to this day. And what used to be the right-wing half of the parliament became the parliament. The center-right civic platform was the new left in relative terms, and the Christian conservative peace was the right. And in 2005, the brothers Kaczynski rose to power on an anti-corruption platform. Lech Kaczynski, now mayor of Warsaw, was running for president against Donald Tusk, so even though Yaroslav led a successful campaign at the head of the Law and Justice Party, when it came time to pick a prime minister, he thought it could hurt his brother's chances if he took the job. So instead, he picked Buzek's former cabinet chief, Kazimierz Marcinkiewicz. Kazimierz Marcinkiewicz. And like in many European countries, it's usually the prime minister who has most of the political power, while the president has some power, but it's more of a ceremonial role. But you have to understand, Marcinkiewicz is what's called a political cipher. He's a tool for Yaroslav to rule through him. Kind of like when Dmitry Medvedev was president of Russia for a while because Vladimir Putin couldn't technically serve another term. Put a pin in that idea, it comes back later. Anyway. Lech becomes president, and a few months later, even though Marcinkiewicz is popular as prime minister, he resigns and Yaroslav takes over. The Kaczynski twins, as heads of both state and government, call for a moral revolution, a historical reference for a return to Polish identity. They create a far-reaching anti-corruption bureau and step up what they call the lustration or purification of Poland, essentially an anti-communist witch hunt, banning anyone who was involved with the pre-1990 communist regime from public office and using the same laws to fire journalists from public television and replacing them with supporters of theirs. Meanwhile, their relations with Russia, Germany, and the European Union, which Poland had just joined in 2004, were at an all-time low. By 2007, Yaroslav's government coalition collapsed, and he called for early elections, which he lost to the civic platform. Tusk's ideology is liberal conservatism, liberal as in liberalizing the economy. He ran on a platform of tax cuts and privatizations. But once in office, he changed his mind on cutting taxes, instead raising the value-added tax as well as taxes on oil, coal, alcohol, and tobacco, and got rid of a bunch of tax exemptions. His administration also faced allegations of collusion over its handling, or rather its lack of handling, of a pyramid scheme his son was involved in. But what really hurt him in the polls, and stop me if you've heard this before, is when he raised the age of retirement in 2013. I skipped over an important part of the story. 
When Yaroslav Kaczynski was ousted as prime minister in 2007, Lech stayed on as president until his death in a plane crash in the Russian city of Smolensk along with all 95 other passengers and crew on board on April 10, 2010. The Kaczynskis were aggressively anti-Russia, and Yaroslav, to this day, is convinced that Putin assassinated his twin brother and that Tusk was either involved or at the very least helped cover it up. So this is way more personal to him than any normal political rivalry. A 2011 report found no evidence of foul play, but they just see that as part of the cover-up, and a later report concluded in 2022 that the crash was orchestrated by Russia. But that investigation, which was under peace, allegedly tampered with evidence to reach that conclusion. Now, the idea of Putin crashing a plane to get rid of an enemy is not far-fetched, but killing the sitting president of a NATO country, though, I'm not saying he would never do it, but the alternative explanation is just more likely, which is a combination of bad weather, they couldn't even see the landing strip, pilot errors like misinterpreting altitude data from the plane's navigation system, and being pressured from an official on board to land despite the difficult conditions. Nevertheless, on the fifth anniversary of the Smolensk air disaster in 2015, Beast held massive rallies across the country, which kickstarted their second rise to power. But two more things were happening at the same time. On the one hand, there was the fallout of the Euromaidan revolution in Ukraine, which ousted pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych, to which Russia responded by annexing Crimea and fueling a proxy war in the eastern regions of the country. This caused hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians to flee mostly to Poland, on the other hand, the Mediterranean migrant crisis. In 2015 alone, 1.3 million people, mostly fleeing the Syrian civil war, but plenty coming from other countries in Asia and Africa, sought refuge in the European Union. The civic platform government's openness to taking in some of those migrants was the final nail in the coffin of their 2015 re-election campaign. Poland was open to Ukrainian refugees, but not to others. So the main argument was related to the division between perceived and constructed differences between refugees from Africa and, and Asia and people who are seeking asylum from countries that are perceived as closer in cultural terms to, uh, to, to Poland. During the so-called migration crisis, it was a uh, very... Um, famous and well-known claim of uh, Beata Szydło, previous uh, prime minister of Poland, who claimed that Poland already has over a million of, of refugees from uh, from Ukraine, and for us it's enough. And it was like a justification that we don't need to take part in the resolving uh, problems in other parts of Europe. This was a pretty big change from Poland's previous attitude towards immigration. In the early 2000s, over 2 million Poles took advantage of the EU's freedom of movement to seek opportunity elsewhere. And the World Values Survey from before the migrant crisis found that only 7.2% of Polish people would not want to have immigrants as neighbors. More than Sweden, but less than Germany or Spain. Jump forward a couple of years, that number is now 18.9%, and there's this huge backlash against refugees from Africa and the Middle East, especially if they're Muslim. This led to a rift with the EU. In 2020, the European Court of Justice ruled that Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic broke the law by refusing asylum seekers arriving from the Mediterranean. But this distinction between a Ukrainian and other refugees continued later on when two other waves of refugees happened almost simultaneously. Of course, in 2022, more Ukrainians fled Russia's invasion, but a year earlier, Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko responded to European economic sanctions by purposely bringing in migrants from the Middle East to send them across the border into Poland in order to sow division in the European bloc in what has been described as a form of hybrid war. The government immediately started blocking them and also blocking the people on the border, also like pushing them back, uh, legalize the push back, uh, pushbacks uh, in the Polish law very quickly. Uh, mobilize the border guards, mobilize the police, uh, then build the fence on the border. Simultaneously, there was a campaign um, presenting the migrants in the worst light, uh, showing only men, uh, saying that they are threats uh, to the Polish security, they are threats to Polish women. Some of the politicians were also saying that they are here to rape, they are here to steal, they are here to burn cars. So the response to the Ukrainian um, movement of people, the refugees who came here after the out outburst of war, was completely different. Uh, it was a contrast. Uh, they were accepted, uh, they were being taken care of, uh, it was mediatized as in how Poland is doing it really well, uh, devoting money, how people have big hearts to accept these refugees uh, in their houses, for instance. But obviously, right, uh, they were like the good white refugees every kind of, of surveys and, uh, and opinion polls 
shows that polls in general are open towards Ukrainians, both in terms of labor migration and uh, refugees, but they have negative attitudes toward helping people from other countries, especially those that are very distant in terms of geography. I, I don't want to mm-hmm. use the term ethnicity, religion and so on, but it's, it's highly racialized uh, d- discourse. Nobody will, will tell you that we, we don't want to black people or, or Asians uh, uh, here in Poland, but um, it's strictly related to, um, to, 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 to the construction of, of uh, uh, ethno-racial hierarchies. And what is really uh, striking is that the Polish-Belarusian um, border crisis and the Ukrainian crisis were happening at the same time. They were happening at the same time. So at the same time there were people dying in the forest because they were pushed back a couple of times, they were dying on, of hunger and of cold. And on the other hand, there were people who were accepted, welcomed, given a you know, provisory ID, given a chance to work here immediately, treated completely differently, two different speeds. Nowadays, peace politicians avoid attributing that difference to Islam, rather saying that it's because they're illegal immigrants, referring to them as living weapons in Belarus's hybrid war. But if you go back to 2015, they use rhetoric opposing Christians and Muslims. Hungarian President Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party are the most explicit on this, saying Muslims are a threat to Europe's Christian identity and their stance on immigration is meant to defend it. And while peace and Fidesz are aligned on almost every issue except their relationship with Russia, peace is not quite as straightforward as their Hungarian counterparts when it comes to that kind of rhetoric. They do, however, attribute the fact that yes, Poland is one of the safest countries in Europe to how homogenous it is as a country in contrast to Western Europe. Poland is not the only uh, the, the only country where border management, um, access to labor markets, and, and all those admission policies are directly related, of course, in public discourse with the issues uh, of, uh, of, of security. And also with uh, with social cohesion and in this in this discourse very visible in far right uh, media uh, and social media different images and 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 different visions of lack of security and lack of social cohesion is showed as an example of uh, of failure of western societies and that push for homogeneity has started to affect how they view ukrainian refugees as well what was visible in the in the recent uh, studies uh, is that polls change their attitude toward Ukrainians, uh, and most people have a negative attitude towards any kind of maintaining differences, cultural differences. But on the other hand, some polls have told me that all of this misses the point entirely, which is that unlike France, the UK, Belgium, and other Western European countries, Poland was never a colonial empire, and it shouldn't have to shoulder the burden of paying for those countries' colonial history, especially because it simply can't afford to economically. It's not only that we we don't like other, other people, uh, but that Poles feel that we don't have enough funding to offer support for for everybody and in general i i, I think that the economic reasons are uh, are really important here it's not only black and white Anyway, back to 2015. Peace won back-to-back landslide victories in the presidential and parliamentary elections. They control an absolute majority of the same. And things feel different now, with many, including former peace members, saying the party has drifted further right and has grown more authoritarian during its time in the opposition, especially since Lech's death. They returned to power under Prime Minister Beata Szydło, a member of the more radical, religious, and Eurosceptic faction of the party, and she was later replaced by the more moderate-seeming Mateusz Morawiecki. Meanwhile, President Andrzej Duda was elected as a peace candidate candidates, but has since technically left the party and he's officially an independent now, but everyone knows who calls the shots behind the scenes. Andrzej Duda has a nickname in Polish politics. Can you tell me what it is? Długopis. 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 Yeah, Długopis too. What does that mean? Uh, it's a pen. Because he he's signing almost everything. So who's the real leader of Poland right now? Now Kaczynski. You know, Andrzej Duda is not, uh, he's a president, but uh, he's not very important in building politics. Same the Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, who was invited to be a Prime Minister, but he was not in a party, so uh, he's he was outsider and he's still outsider somehow. Jarosław Kaczynski is the guy who's, uh, who's ruling the 
low injustice. On the populist side, Beast lowered the age of retirement back to what it was before, raised the minimum wage, and introduced a baby bonus in response to the low birth rates. Families receive a monthly 500 zlotys, about 130 euros, for every second child until they turn 18. Peace is a party that came to power because of frustration of a large group of society, even anger. And I think it was a party that knew how to channel this anger. And this is why they won, actually, because these people were forgotten, marginalized, and not being taken care of uh, historically. So for them, like direct money transfers, like child benefit, uh, retirement benefit, were something really good. But we shouldn't forget that that was immediate money. It was not like long-term reforms that made the life of these people better. But that was just something that was instant gratific political instant gratification for these people that was perceived as something positive. But before any of that, the first thing they did when they returned to power was to take control of the courts forcing the appointment of five constitutional tribunal judges in 2015, causing a constitutional crisis that continues to this day. And in 2019, they passed a law allowing them to fire almost any judge who engages in political activity, though that's vaguely defined and could include just questioning the political independence of the panel that enforces that law. This was a major red flag that led international observers to worry about the erosion of democracy in the country, fearing it was following in the footsteps of Hungary under Viktor Orban, a guy who's so clearly a dictator that European leaders call him that behind his back the dictator is coming. <laughs> and to his face. Dictator. And the EU has blocked funding to both Poland and Hungary over their government's gradual undermining of democracy. But Poland used their complete control of the courts to implement a near total ban on abortion, prompting massive protests in the country. I think that the moment that people realized that democracy is being taken away from them was the ban on abortion. I think that when this law passed, I think that people realized that they are being aggressed by the government and decisions are being taken without their participation. The judiciary was uh, also a big thing, but and also the, the breach of the violation of constitution, but it didn't mobilize as many people as the attack on women's rights. Meanwhile, the country was never a beacon of LGBTQ rights, but a campaign of state-backed hate speech took place under peace, with municipalities covering a third of the country declaring themselves LGBT free zones, a move The Economist described as a legally meaningless gimmick with the practical effect of declaring open season on gay people. They also furthered their control of public television channels, which is now fully in peace's pocket in contrast to independent media. But in the run-up to this year's election, they had their own corruption scandal called Visagate, or the Visa Mafia Affair, which showed the Polish government illegally gave out up to 350,000 work visas to people from Asia and the Middle East in exchange for bribes, tens of thousands of euros apiece. The scandal broke only months before the election, and contributed to damaging Peace's image among voters who supported them specifically because of their anti-immigration stance. And that brings us to election day on October 15th, with democracy on a knife's edge and Donald Tusk returning to Polish politics after serving five years as president of the European Council. And the question is, love him or hate him, and most people are at best lukewarm about him, as leader of the opposition, can he prevent peace from winning another term? Civic platform on its own, not a chance. But there are other parties in play, and while they don't agree on much, the one thing they do agree on is how dangerous peace is for the future of the country. So let's do a quick rundown of who the main players are in the election, but a quick note. Polish parties are a little bit like Russian nesting dolls. There's parties inside of parliamentary groups, inside of alliances, inside of coalitions. If you fully break it down, there are 23 parties with representation in the same, and we're not going to look at every single one of them. But they come together into five groups, which are technically called political alliances, but most people refer to those alliances as the main parties. I asked voters for some quick one-word descriptions of each one of them. We've already talked about the first two, but just for the sake of it, first up is peace. The name of the alliance is the United Right, but it's almost entirely composed of law and justice. Here's what came to mind. Liar. Uh, rubbish. Fucking. Liar. I think, yeah, liar too. My first thought is about the church and power of the church in Poland. Then there's the Civic Coalition, which is the Civic Platforms Alliance. The other uh, politics, it's worse. Not a good option to choose. <laughs> Rubbish. Opposite to peace. <laughs> in between those two, there's a new alliance called Cetia Droga, or Third Way, which is seen as an alternative for moderately conservative Christians who feel peace is just too far gone. I don't have opinion about that. Nothing much. And I think it's an interesting uh, option. Rubbish. These are politicians who think that uh, the people can be exhausted 
of fighting between two biggest political powers or between Kaczynski and Tusk. So if you are uh, tired on this, you should maybe choose the third way, let's say. On the left, or what remains of the left in Poland, the progressive social democrats of Lewica. It's right for women, right for uh, animals. LGBT plus. Pretty good. Rubbish. I don't like them. Social politics, progressive in the cultural issues, and uh, like the social democratic part, let's say. And on the other side, you have the far-right libertarians of Confederacja, or Confederacy. Nazi. <laughs> Confederacja, no, no, no. Angry, definitely angry. Should uh, even exist. Some bad sides uh, and some bad, good sides. Uh, rubbish. Confederacja is the shittest, shittest, shittest. <laughs> okay, let's talk more about them because they're pretty freaking spicy and they could have been and may still be major players in the future. They combine fundamentalist Christian views with radical libertarian economic policies like completely doing away with income tax, drastically reducing corporate taxes, and getting rid of socialized health care. They don't want to support public health insurance, you know? And that's because they cannot imagine that something bad can, can happen to them. If you're like, what, what is the age gap for Confederacia Voters? Like 18 to 30, maybe? Yeah, These are just young men Most that young are... Men, uh, you know? They are healthy, they don't have family, they don't relate to the topics that are like medical, for example, so they don't give a shit about that. Confederacja is saying so like cool, amazing things about economics, but if you calculate it, this literally has no like chance to happen. No chance. Some of their other stances include an even stricter ban on abortion, legalizing firearms, and they're tacitly pro-Russia or at the very least explicitly anti-Ukraine. Some Confederacja politicians have argued women should have a status in the household barely above pets and furniture. One of their founders, Janusz Korwin Mika, thinks women shouldn't have the right to vote, at least not until menopause, and says all sex involves an element of rape. And according to him, if she isn't screaming, it's consensual. Oh God. Also, this. Był taki człowiek, który chciał, żeby dzieciom polskim było lepiej. Nazywał się Adolf Hitler. Now, Confederacja defenders will say, sure, he's cringe, but he's the older generation. He isn't even in leadership anymore, and he was actually expelled from the party after the election anyway. Okay, but you know who is in leadership? This guy, Slavomir Metzen, one of the two chairmen of the party. And according to him, these are the unofficial five points of Confederacja. Piątka Konfederacji. Nie chcemy Żydów, homoseksualistów, aborcji, podatków i Unii Europejskiej. Straight from the horse's mouth. Now, he says that was taken out of context, but it really wasn't. There's no context that makes it any better. In fact, it completely fits within the overall context of the party's image. Just like when another Confederacja politician used the fire extinguisher on a Hanukkah display in the parliament building a few days ago. By election day, it's clear PiS can't win half of the seats in parliament on their own. No party can. So the two questions are, can the civic coalition, along with Levitsa and Third Way, win a combined 231 seats in the same to form a governing coalition? And if not, meaning the remaining two parties, PiS and Confederacja, put together half half of parliament, would they agree to work together, which is the only path peace would have to staying in power? I mean, after all, their views overlap on some of the fundamentalist Christian nationalist beliefs, and Poland is a very religious country, although that has been falling drastically in recent decades. However, the two parties agree on almost nothing else. Not on Russia, not on social programs, not on taxes. And Confederacja ran an entire campaign attacking peace from the right. I think it would be like a mission impossible because from the very beginning like the DNA of Confederacja is to be anti-system. So anti-system means that they are anti-everyone basically and they announced from the very beginning they wouldn't create a coalition with peace. No matter like what kind of difference there are, like what is common for many politicians is like they want to have a power. And as voting day draws to a close, all that's left to do is wait for the exit polls. Something hilarious about Polish elections is there's something called an electoral silence law, which is that starting at midnight on Friday, you can't talk about anything that might sway the results of the election, like no vote counts, nothing like that, uh, to prevent kind of last minute fake news that doesn't have time to get fact checked before people vote. But what you see on Twitter is that a lot of people start to share like weird groceries lists that say like uh, pistachio is 40 zloty and 60 cents or tomato is 27 zloty and 20 cents. So these shopping lists are shared by people with presumably insider knowledge of the vote tallying results who are finding 
creative ways to share preliminary results. So pistachios are obviously pis confitury, which is gem in Polish is for confederacja. And they're obviously completely unreliable. First of all, we have no idea what the source is. They could be made up for all we know. And secondly, even if they're not made up, they're partial tallies, they're preliminary vote counts. So they can swing wildly in a matter of hours, depending on where the votes are reported from. But it is a pretty creative and hilarious way of bypassing the electoral silence laws. With an unprecedented turnout of 74% and a huge surge among young voters, especially women, opposition parties were able to secure 248 out of the 460 seats in parliament. PiS remains the largest party, but even if it did join forces with Confederacja, they'd still be 18 seats short of a majority. But the victory belongs to the center-right rather than to the left, with most of the gains being made by the Civic Coalition and Third Way, while Levitsa actually lost 22 seats. The undisputed losers, though, are the right, with PiS losing 41 seats and Confederacja dramatically underperforming when they were expected to be the kingmakers in this election. Most civilized countries, the law, medicine, different uh, branches of public life are defined and are defined by authorities like lawyers, I don't know, you know, doctors, specialists in economy, specialists in what else, uh, I don't know, yeah, public like relations in European Union. And here the government, what they did for past years is literally they tore this, all these things down. There are no authorities in Poland. The only thing that matters the is court, what they say. Please. I want back the uh, the significance of authorities in each uh, sector. Economically, like I am actually working in finance. Economically, it's like 20 years to build up something they broke. The whole European Union, the Europe, and also the US, they are becoming more right wing. And I was thinking that in Poland, we might be like one of the first countries to break the rule. It's been two months since the election, and Andrzej Duda, who's still president, did everything he could to slow the process down and prevent the opposition from forming a government. On Monday, December 11th, the day I'm filming this, the final hurdles were cleared, paving the way for Tusk to take office as prime minister once again. So what can be expected from this new coalition? There is this 100 promises of Tusk for 100 first days of the rule, and I imagine Tusk will want to uh, make justice to these 100 points, and among them are uh, in the introduction of civil partnerships um, there is the uh, getting the money from the European Union there is the making the public TV public again so making it free of peace influence there is also um, legalizing the abortion up to the 12th uh, week of pregnancy and a lot of other things a very urgent question is to make uh, you know the judiciary regain the independence However, despite far-right discourse online, there's one thing that's not expected to change. I'm afraid uh, the stand on immigration is not going to change that much. I, uh, from what Tusk was saying before uh, the elections, I think he's not going to be more pro-migrant. The only pro-migrant party is Levica, and the rest of the parties are either overtly anti-migrant, uh, I mean in the whole parliament, in the whole same, or the coalition uh, of the opposition parties, I think K.O. is not going to risk and introduce more migrant-friendly uh, policies and Trzecia Droga even less so. So peace, even if it's not in control of the government, isn't going anywhere. For now, they still have the presidency, they're the biggest party in parliament, and they've been packing the courts for the last eight years. There's a lot to do to reverse the damage done to the country's institutions. But for now, at least, is Polish democracy broken? I think there were strong attempts to break the Polish democracy and it didn't work because the turnout speaks for itself. And this turnout made us realize that all the protests in favor of women's rights, in favor of constitution, in favor of the judiciary, they transformed them themselves into a very high turnout in voting. So it means that even after these eight years of uh, destruction of democracy, Poles have not forgotten what privilege 
what rights they have, and there is still a very strong democratic feeling. So, what do you hope to happen in the next few years? And if you're from Poland, what are your thoughts on the new government coalition? Also, the presidential election is coming up in a couple of years. Do you expect it to confirm the results of this year's election? Let me know what you think in the comments. It was an absolute blast making this video. I had an incredible time here in Poland and I met a bunch of amazing people. So I want to thank everyone who took the time to speak with me, especially Pia, who was just unbelievably generous with her time during what was probably the busiest week she's had in years. And I just couldn't have made this video without her. I also couldn't have made this video without you, the viewers, especially those who support me on Patreon or those who donated on YouTube. I want to make a lot more videos like this and I'd like to be even more ambitious in the topics and how I choose to cover them. But that takes a lot of resources and time and effort, and for that I'd really need to get to the point where I can afford to do this sustainably. So if you want to and can afford to contribute to that, the best way you can support me is on Patreon. If I can get to the point where I know that regardless of the YouTube algorithm, my expenses and my bills are covered, that would take a huge weight off my shoulders and just allow me to dedicate myself to making the next video and not worry about how it's going to perform or how the last one performed and how much revenue I'm getting because I know that I'm good to go anyway. So you can help me with that for as little as three euros a month and you also get bonus content like more footage from the interviews that I shot for this video. But look, if you can't afford to subscribe on Patreon, that's totally fine, don't worry about it because there's so many more ways you can help if you want to, like just subscribing to the YouTube channel because every new subscriber I have has a huge impact on how seriously I'm taken when I just ask for interviews. Another way you can help is I'm putting all of my time into making these videos and honestly, I'm not particularly good at promoting them. So if you're active on Reddit or in a Facebook community where politics is relevant or any other like your group of friends is interested in these topics and you want to share my videos there that would just be incredibly helpful but for now thank you so much for watching and i'll see you soon